per monthly program for the Audubon chapter of Minneapolis. We're delighted to have you with us this evening. I think you're, you're, you're in for a, a very helpful program that will um, help you uh, prepare your, your lawns, your gardens, your um, whatever it is, your, wherever you're living uh, for, the, for the coming months. We like to, uh, my name is Keith Olstead. I uh, chair the board for the Audubon chapter of Minneapolis and it's my delight to be able to bring you this welcome each month. We like to start our programs by finding out what people are, are seeing out there. Um, you can use uh, the chat uh, button at the bottom of your screen to tell us what you've been seeing or you may, um, also raise your hand and we can call on you, but um, uh, please tell us what, it, what have you been seeing out there? I had a, a yellow rumped warbler uh, visit our backyard for a while this afternoon. It was fun to, to see that. Um, but I, when I was down at Wood Lake a few days ago, uh, I had one wave of, of sparrows, primarily white-throated um, uh, sparrows and then um, some uh, orange crowned warblers and um, uh, I think one common yellow throat. But that was pretty much it. I didn't see any thrushes. So uh, let's hear what you've been seeing. Uh, we'll keep our eyes on that uh, chat uh, tool and um, you can let us know what you're seeing. Been keeping my eye on the um, uh, keeping my eye on the um, Minnesota birding photography site where people are getting some nice shots of sandhill cranes. I hear we've had our first uh, chat posting about um, more white-breasted nuthatches showing up at Tatie's feeders. Um, Angie is seeing lots of chickadees and goldfinches in, on her cup plants. Uh, Joseph um, was at Wood Lake on Sunday and saw some double crested cormorants and a, an American white pelican. That pelican has been hanging out there for maybe a couple of weeks now. Um, and uh, the uh, neotropic cormorant uh, was also still seen at um, Richfield Lake just a few days ago. Um, so it's hanging around uh, enjoying this weather. They fortunately can continue to get their food from the open water. Um, some of the other species will be nervous about when the weather gets cold enough to restrict their access to insects. My mountain ash berries are starting to um, ripen, so I'm getting more uh, cedar waxwings and some thrushes in our mountain ash tree. But what are you seeing? Let us share with us your recent sightings and what's got, what's got you excited in the migra migratory bird world. And while you're typing and um, and remembering all your great outings, uh, let me say that the um, uh, CARE 11, Channel 11, apparently has noticed that the migration is happening as well. So at 10 o'clock tonight, CARE 11 has uh, let us know that they'll be um, broadcasting a segment on bird migration and window strikes. Um, they interviewed uh, our former board chair, uh, Jerry Balls, who's been a real leader in and um, asking the city and um, people like at the Viking Stadium and so on to address uh, bird strikes against uh, reflective glass. Uh, they've, so Jerry is interviewed for this interview. Um, our the co-chair of our advocacy committee was interviewed, Constance Pepin. Um, so after tonight's program, if you're looking for some good news, check out channel 11 and what they report about the bird migrations. So um, here Sue is asking whether the hummingbirds have left for the season. She's seen some th this year feeding in, in the, uh, on the cardinal flower in her rain garden. Um, it's my impression that most of the hummingbirds are out of the area now. 
Um, and uh, it's, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm sorry to see them go because they sure are fun to watch, but um, they were, they were, um, there were still other birds to be seen. Well, it looks like we're not getting a lot of other reports. So um, because we have a great program to get into, let's um, move ahead with our uh, plan for the program. Um, Katie Burns, the chair of our Community Engagement Committee, uh, will be introducing tonight's speaker. So Katie, why don't you take it away? Thank you. Yeah, so fall is always an exciting time, uh, certainly here in the upper Midwest for a number of reasons. We get pretty jazzed about uh, things like apples and cider and color changes and deciduous trees. It's a pretty big to do. Uh, but there's a lot of other things that are happening in the world around us that sometimes don't get talked about or don't get near as much attention. And uh, here at Audubon Chapter in Minneapolis, we are, of course, all about the birds. And we live smack dab in the middle of the most popular migratory pathway for birds, the Mississippi Flyway. So there's a lot of things that are happening here. And our guest tonight uh, is going to be able to share with us things that we can do in the fall uh, around where we live that can support birds and other wildlife, and not just in the fall, uh, but it extends even beyond that. She's got some really, really cool things to share with us. Um, so this is Angie Hong, and she is the coordinator for Minnesota's East Metro Water Resource Education Program, a local government partnership hosted by Washington Conservation District. And just to share a little bit about her, uh, outside of her professional day, in her free time, she enjoys singing, competing in triathlons, and exploring the prairies, woods, and waterways of the St. Croix Valley. Uh, definitely a pretty incredible place to be able to, uh, to enjoy and to call home. Uh, Angie, I am super excited to have you here tonight. Um, as we mentioned before we started the program, you've actually given a program with us before, uh, not too many years ago. Um, so we are happy to have you back and really excited to dive into what you have uh, to share with us tonight. And I think you have some really great perspectives that make these actions that we can take to make uh, the world a little bit better for birds and wildlife and also the planet, very achievable and attainable. And I think it'll be really rewarding for our members that live here in the upper Midwest, uh, but maybe a little bit further away as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it is a pleasure to be with this group again, and I'll go ahead and queue up uh, my slideshow here. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about creating bird-friendly, I'm calling it fall communities, but as Katie was saying, it um, is bird-friendly communities throughout the year. But since it is fall, just kind of emphasis on what we can do during the fall time. So uh, you already got a great introduction to me. Uh, this is my contact information if you wanted to follow up later on or if you live out in Washington County and want to learn more about some of the programs we have in our area. There are a number of ways to get a hold of me. And I do have a weekly blog where I write about a lot of our local programs that we have here. Um, so my office, I am officed out of the Washington Conservation District, which is located in Washington County. It is one of the soil and water conservation districts that we have all across Minnesota. Every county in Minnesota, with the exception of Hennepin and Ramsey County has one in Hennepin and Ramsey. It's now, um, those services are provided by the county. Um, but the Soil and Water Conservation District in Washington County provides free site visits to any landowners who are interested in doing water quality and habitat improvement projects on their land, want advice on how to do invasive species management, want to build a rain garden, you name it. Uh, and we also are very adept at connecting people with grants, whether they are state grants, local grants, federal grants to do projects that protect and improve our natural resources. And then we do a lot of workshops throughout the year. But that's not all. That's not the only person I work for. Um, it's actually a partnership. Um, the East Metro Water Resource Education Program is 25 local units of government that all work together to provide education to the public about, about protecting our water. 
Um, so I have a map here showing the eight different watershed management areas in Washington County and the different um, entities that manage those. And then in addition, we have the county and 15 of the cities that are all part of this program. Okay, so on to what I am going to talk about tonight. I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about birds and migration, since that is what is happening right now. And then wanna highlight five ways that we can help to protect birds throughout the year, but especially during migration time. Um, so talk about the lights out programs, some fall gardening tips, buckthorn removal, protecting water resources, and then planning for next year. Okay, so as Katie said, we are in the midst of the fall migration and living where we are in the Twin Cities area are right smack dab in the middle of the Mississippi Flyway, which is a quarter used by 325 species of birds. So there are literally billions of birds that are flying through right now, coming from different locations where they are spending their summer times and going down to their overwintering locations. And the birds are generally using the riverways. So the Mississippi River, the St. Croix River, the Minnesota River, because it provides corridors of connected habitat and a, um, you know, a, a navig something to help them navigate along the way. So uh, we are just kind of smack dab in the middle of it and seeing lots of birds at this time of year that we might not see at other times of the year. Uh, so I want you to get your, get your chats um, ready. We're just going to play a fun and easy game and this is where I admit to you that I am not a bird expert. I am actually not. I am a generalist in terms of environmental education. I love birds and I know a bit about birds, um, but I know that you all know a lot about birds and that there are probably some people who have logged on to this webinar because you're like me, you kind of like birds, but maybe aren't a bird expert. So we're just gonna, I'm gonna share some photos of some common birds and I want your guesses, are they ones that migrate or not? So we're starting with an easy one, a chickadee. Chickadee dee 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 dee. So go ahead and drop your guess in the chat. Does the chickadee migrate or does the chickadee not migrate? We've got one guess, don't think so. No? Okay, you're right, chickadees, not usually migrating, nope. Because if you think to, think of a winter's day going out on kind of a quiet winter's day and standing in the woods, what is maybe one of the only sounds that you can hear? It's probably that chickadee dee dee dee, -dee kind of echoing in the woods, chickadee dee dee dee. How about this one? If you look at the photo, use your context clues, I bet you can guess, does the cardinal migrate or not? <laughs> Context clues? Nope, not a migrator? Nope, probably not. Okay, what about this one? We've got a barred owl. This is the one that makes the who cooks for you sound. The hoo -hoo, ho -hoo, ho -hoo, ho -hoo. Do I see it? I didn't, I didn't catch if there was new guesses or not. Is this one that's migrating? Okay, not migrating, not migrating. Okay, what about the robin? What about the robin? We always hear that this is one of the first signs of spring, right? When you start to see the robins coming back. So these are ones that will not always, but usually migrate. Okay, what about the goldfinch? Does goldfinch migrate? Goldfinch migrate? I believe that the, that the goldfinches migrate, that most of them migrate. Here's one last one. Great blue heron. This one, if you think about where it's getting its food from, it should be pretty obvious. These, this is one of the ones that definitely migrates. 
definitely migrates. Okay. So just a little, a little fun to warm up our brains here. Of the 240 species of birds that live in Minnesota during at least part of the year, only 20 of them don't migrate. And I got this nice list from Jim, Jim Gilbert in a Star Tribune article a couple of years ago of birds that stay. Um, there are a few species of grouse and owls that stay. There are uh, several species of the woodpeckers that stay, the white-breasted nuthatch, the black-capped chickadee, northern cardinal, house sparrow, ring-neck pheasant. So there's not a lot of birds that actually stay during the wintertime. The vast majority of the birds are migrating and going to another location. Um, I live out in Stillwater and working in Washington County and working in the St. Croix Valley and the St. Croix watershed. And like the Mississippi River, it acts as a migratory corridor. It is also home to about 60 species of birds that are considered species of greatest conservation need. So we've done a lot of work out in, air, in our area working with private landowners and public land managers on improving habitat to be able to protect these bird species and to be able to create better habitat so that we can have more of them in the future. And I just wanted to introduce a few of these to you because these are definitely less common birds that if you aren't a serious birder, it's very likely you've never seen them before with your own eyes. Um, but these are ones that you could come out to, um, you know, Interstate State Park or William O'Brien State Park, um, any of the places along the St. Croix River and have a chance of seeing some of these birds. So we've got a loggerhead shrike, a red-headed woodpecker. I've not actually seen one of these in real life before. I've only seen photos of them. Red-shouldered hawk, not to be confused with the red-tailed hawk, which is fairly common, but the red-shouldered hawk, much less common. The wood thrush, these are what I like to call the LBBs, the little brown birds, the ones that all kind of look similar to one another, at least they do to me. It's, a, it's one of the LBBs, wood, a little wood thrush. Um, but we have, like I said, 60 species that are species of greatest conservation need, and we are working um, as much as we can to try to protect and improve their habitat. So I want to move on to talking about some of these ways that we can help to support the birds. And the first one that if you are Audubon members, you are probably familiar with is the Lights Out program. So this is an effort to have large buildings, especially tall buildings, uh, turn out their lights from midnight until 6 a.m. during the migratory time of year in order to protect birds, a lot of whom are flying at nighttime. Um, the birds can become confused by the lights in the buildings and end up running into them and dying along the way. So the Lights Out program has been operated by Audubon Minnesota for a number of years now, and you can actually go on the website and see a long list of all of the buildings in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and surrounding cities that have signed on to participate. And essentially, they are asking these building managers to turn off the lights between midnight and dawn in the fall migration time. August 15th to October 31st, or the spring migration time, and also to turn off exterior decorating lighting um, that's not needed for safety, to dim the lobby and atrium lights, and turn off interior lights. Uh, and just kind of an anecdote, so it's ironic that I was giving this presentation tonight because I got a number of inquiries from concerned people in Stillwater just in the past week that apparently there have been a large number of bird collisions and bird deaths in downtown Stillwater, um, running into buildings that really aren't that tall. We're talking about buildings that are maybe five stories tall, um, but because of its proximity to the river, they have been seeing a number of warblers that have been running into the buildings. And so uh, community members are, you know, reaching out to those businesses now and talking to them about this Lights Out program and how they can get involved. Um, but the Lights Out Network, there are similar programs all around the country. So you can look on a map on the you know, National Audubon website and be able to see all sorts of different locations where there are these similar Lights Out programs being held. Um, but what my office more often works on is, um, yes, and that, that is a great point. Everybody can help with lights out and it's not just companies or building managers. So especially 
be um, especially the part about turning out the exterior lights. Um, that is just, you know, a simple thing that pretty much everybody can do at our homes, not have, um, you know, not have the floodlights or the light on the front door going all night long around this time of year. Honestly, we don't pretty much any time of year, <laughs> just for, um, you know, saving electricity. We, we don't really see a need to have a light on outside our house to begin with. Um, so at our office, we are most often working with people on how they manage their landscape, whether that is a tiny residential yard, a farm, or a landscape around a business. And if you think about um, what wildlife need, not just birds, but all wildlife, they need food, they need water, they need shelter, they need space. And so I am offering to you four photos to help you start thinking about where would a bird find the best habitat? In this case, well, you know, I've, I've given this presentation talking about pollinators, talking about wildlife in general, but just thinking of a bird. So we've got option one. We've got the palatial mansion with the, the rolling, rolling turf. And if you think, hmm, what kind of bird might find habitat there? Well, if it was next to a pond, you'd probably have a whole lot of geese and a whole lot of goose poop. Um, you know, there might be another you know, a couple other little birds that might land there, but uh, you're, you're probably not providing very good habitat. Um, option number two, something that has been gaining more popularity in the past couple of years are pollinator-friendly lawns or bee-friendly lawns. So this is instead of just having turf on our lawn, we might also include some low-growing flowering species like creeping thyme or Dutch white clover. And here we do a good job of providing habitat for some insects and for pollinators like bees. And by doing so, we might be able to provide some, you know, better quality food source for birds, but it's still looking at it is still for all practical purposes a lawn. So we're not gonna find a very wide variety of birds. Um, moving on to option number three, this is starting to get up into the scale of projects that are fun for people to do in their yards if you do own a home and a yard. Um, thinking of creating a native garden, a rain garden, a shoreline planting, something that incorporates native plants that can be big and bold and beautiful, but also really start to provide some of that quality habitat that birds are going to need and really get to the last two pieces on this list, you know, not just the food and water, but also the shelter and the space. Um, and then option number four, most of us are not lucky enough to own, you know, huge expanses of property, but for people who do, we do have a number of large landowners out in our area and we do work with them to try to enhance and, you know, protect that habitat as much as possible. If you don't, it's likely that there are parks and there are public spaces that are in your community where volunteers are working to take care of the habitat. And I'm going to share in a couple of minutes, a few upcoming volunteer opportunities in the month of October. So even if you don't own land of your own, there's still ways that you can um, be in, engaged and active in your community and helping to protect habitat for birds and wildlife. Okay, so we gonna move on to talking a little bit about fall gardening. And the first thing that I like to tell people about fall gardening is, not what you should do, but what you shouldn't do. At this time of year, it really is a time of year to kind of sit back and relax and take it easy. And there's a lot of things that we traditionally have been taught that we should be doing at this time of year that we are now realizing are counterproductive and even detrimental. So one of the things that people tend to do at this time of year is once your flowers are done flowering and you've just got, you know, the the standing stem there with the seed head on it, people think that they need to cut those down, that it doesn't really look very nice. And in fact, that's providing seeds for the birds. And I mentioned at the beginning um, when there was a question, what birds are you seeing in your neighborhood? I have some standing cut plant outside of my uh, dining room window that I'm looking at all the time. And it hasn't had flowers on it for a couple of weeks now, but is just constantly covered in goldfinch and chickadees because they're out there gathering all the seeds and getting themselves fattened up for the winter or for flying. Um, another thing that is important about all those stems is that there are a lot of insects that will lay their eggs inside of those. 
And that is how the eggs actually overwinter. So uh, come springtime, if you were to cut one of those open, and I've done this before as a, you know, when you're hiking in the prairie and you find those golden rods and they have like the round ball on them. If you, if you know what a golden rod plant is, I'm sure you know what I mean. You'll see like, it's like a tall skinny stem and it's got like a round ball. If you cut it open, you can actually sometimes find the larva of the golden rod fly on the inside. Um, but you know, bees will overwinter, the insects will overwinter that way. Um, a lot of the bees and other beneficial insects will do so. And then they will come out in the spring. So wait until the spring to cut down the dried stems and the flowers. On a similar note, we have all been taught that we need to get out there and rake our leaves and rake our lawn and make it back into, you know, a clean green lawn when the leaves start to fall off the trees. Um, but in reality, the leaves have a lot of really great nutrients in them that can be beneficial for our lawns. And especially when the leaves fall in woodland areas or in our gardens, they provide important places for small animals, for insects um, to be able to burrow down and make it through the winter. So we tell people, if you've got wooded areas, if you've got garden areas, leave all the leaves. And in fact, you can even take some leaves off your lawn and put them into those areas. That will help to protect your plants from getting too cold and freezing during the winter, help to keep the soil moist. Um, like I said, provide little pockets of habitat. Um, but on your lawn, you can actually just go ahead and mow over it a couple of times and break up the leaves into really fine pieces so that they will decompose and um, leach the nutrients back into the lawn instead of gathering up all the leaves and you know taking them away and taking away those good nutrients that your soil wants. All right. Let's see why, there we go, okay. Um, so because it is fall and everybody is ooing and eyeing at the leaves right now, I wanted to highlight a couple of plants that are ones you could consider incorporating into your yard to have beautiful fall color and also to continue to provide a source of nectar for um, pollinators and also a source of seeds for birds and other animals that are eating them at this time of year. So one of the plants that always comes to my mind when we're thinking about the fall is the goldenrod. And in the upper left-hand corner, the first picture is like the common goldenrod that you'll see whenever you're walking through old farm fields out in the prairie. So that grows in open sunny areas with sandy soil. But if you have a shady yard like I do, there is another kind of goldenrod called the zigzag goldenrod. And this is one that will grow kind of in the edges of woods and in shady yards. So that's another option and they both bloom at this time of year. There are tons, tons and tons of different kinds of asters and they come in all different shades of light purple and dark purple and pinkish purple and bluish purple and white. And some of them are really tall and lanky and some of them grow more in bunches, but they are all blooming at this time of the year. And in fact, a lot of them will bloom all the way through until the end of October. Um, the blue bottle gentian in my yard is not, let me just move this little box down here. Um, it is not blooming anymore this year. And I swear that it has to do with the drought because I swear that in years past, it has been blooming still into early October. I think it's a really fun plant because it's got this closed um, flower petals that never open up, but bumblebees can vibrate at just the right frequency that they're able to open it up and get in there to get at the pollen and the nectar that's inside the flower. Uh, and they're blue, which is pretty unique. There aren't very many flowers that are blue. Um, sneezeweed, the name makes it sound like it would make you sneeze, but it doesn't. I don't know why they named it that. It's just called sneezeweed and it's got these cute little yellow happy looking flowers. Uh, and then there are shrubs that have really beautiful color at this time of year. Probably one that you notice most often is the sumac. It's just got that brilliant scarlet red. Uh, a lot of times people confuse just the common staghorn sumac with the poison sumac. They actually look nothing like one another. So if you are seeing, um, you know, this kind of sumac, you're seeing it all over the place along the edges of farm fields and roadways, prairies and woods edges. Uh, it is almost certainly just the common staghorn sumac and 
a, you know, a completely beneficial plant, nothing to be worried about. Um, the poison sumac grows only in wetland bog areas. So it's one that you would be much less likely to run into and it doesn't actually look the same. Um, dogwood has really beautiful color at this time of year. I took this photo of a dogwood about a month ago and then just went out last weekend and that same dogwood, all of the dogwood in that area is now almost like a burgundy, just this really pretty deep, rich burgundy. And then there's also a number of prairie plants, uh, little blue stem, big blue stem, Indian grass, um, all sorts of blue grandma grass, side oats grandma that have really pretty color at this time of year as well. So these are all things that you can consider incorporating into your garden for fall color. Okay, so those are all, those are all the good things. Um, then of course, there's an always all good, there's also bad. Um, and the bad one that I wanna talk about as it relates to birds is buckthorn. So we know that invasive species in general are a big problem worldwide, not just in Minnesota. Invasive species have contributed to the decline of about 42% of threatened and endangered species. And most uh, conservationists and biologists consider invasive species to be one of the biggest threats to uh, wildlife, to, um, you know, to, to species viability. So 100 million acres of land in the U.S. have invasive plant infestations, and the estimated cost to the economy is $120 billion per year. And just showing you some photos here of two that are particularly problematic down in the southern U.S., kudzu, this is that upper picture, um, is one that just kind of takes over, and you can see just goes right over the tops of trees and smothers them underneath. In our area, buckthorn is probably the one that we hear the most people complaining about. Um, it is a, there we go. It is, starts as a small shrub, but if it is left unchecked, it can actually grow up to be, you know, a rather mid-sized tree. <laughs> uh, they have these dark green leaves and have parallel stems. So, um, sub opposite leaves, but you know, parallel stems. So there are, that is one way to recognize them. The females get these purple berries and they do have little kind of thorn-like tips at the ends of them. What I think makes it easier to recognize, particularly in the fall, is that buckthorn will be one of the last ones to remain green when everything else has lost its color. So this makes this one of the best times of the year to treat buckthorn or to figure out that you have buckthorn in your property. So if you're looking out and you have some woods in the back of your yard and you look and it looks like this, uh, chances are everything that is green is going to be buckthorn or if it's not buckthorn, it's probably a different invasive species. So pretty much everything that is green is something that you can safely get rid of without worrying that you are misidentifying it. Um, so buckthorn, it originally came from Europe. It was brought over intentionally. Like many of our invasive species, people thought that it was really beautiful in Europe. It, they use it as a hedgerow. And when it came here, it did not stay put the way that it does in Europe. So it has since become a really big problem. And in a lot of our local woodlands, it has invaded to the point that we don't have uh, the other native plants there that need to support the wildlife. So what are some of the best options for treating buckthorn? This is, um, like I said, one of the biggest questions that we get from the public. And it's really tough because I'm going to be totally honest, buckthorn is super hard to treat and get rid of. Um, it is the kind of plant, if you were to just cut it down and do nothing, then it will just sprout right back up again out of that stump. And it tends to come back with even more stems than it had before. I call it a medusa. Um, so some of your options, if you are going to cut down a stump, it is best if you treat that stump with herbicide afterwards. Otherwise, like I said, it will come back again. Um, there are little buckthorn baggies that people can, you can buy online and they're like black bags that you put over the top of the stump so it doesn't re-sprout again. Um, a couple of other options. Uh, people, for a long time, we were really promoting the use of weed wrenches. 
that you use. It's the second picture here. Um, it's like a lever and you've got, you know, this bright orange weed branch and you can pull the buckthorn right out of the ground roots and all so it doesn't grow back. So that's great because then you don't have to use herbicide. Um, but the downside is that it really disturbs the soil underneath. And we discovered over time that sometimes it seems like it's actually causing more invasive species to come in. So if you have an area where you were pulling out buckthorn, then as soon as that was out, then a bunch of garlic mustard came in in its place. Um, another option to try if you are okay using small amounts of herbicide is basal bark treatment. And this is basically just taking um, herbicide if you have like a backpack spray with a tiny little wand and can use it to just put it just at the base of buckthorn plants and be able to kind of kill them standing dead without pulling them out of the ground or without cutting them down. Um, and that avoids disturbing the soil and is a lot less work if you're treating a really large area. Um, a fourth option, this is the most fun of all. A fourth option is you can rent some goats. Uh, in Washington County, Washington County Parks has been using goats to clear invasive species and help them with some of the oak savanna restoration that they have been doing at Lake Elmo Regional Park, Woodland, Reser Woodland um, Restoration at Cottage Grove Ravine Regional Park. And it's super fun. People love the goats. Of course they love the goats. Um, so these are the goats at Lake Elmo Park Reserve during the summertime where they are clearing some invasive species and eating up some of the little buckthorn saplings that are starting to come back up again. And then this is a photo of what it looked like in late November, where you can actually see the lake through the woods. Um, this is a spot where five years ago, you actually couldn't see the water if you were standing in the trail at the spot because the, the buckthorn was so thick. And now you can see it's just nice clear down to the water. Um, Constance says, even treating the stumps may not prevent sprouting. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So um, the hack, hack, hack again works. <laughs> it does work. It, and as long as you have um, a small enough area that you can continually keep hitting the plants over and over, that's a great option. Um, we do also use mowing sometimes um, because that kind of accomplishes that same goal of, you know, the hack, hack, hack again. Okay, so we know that buckthorn is a problem and this is where you can potentially get involved and help to do something about it. And I offer not one, not two, not three, but four, four, four possible times. Basically every single weekend in October, you could be out there, you could be helping to remove buckthorn and helping to improve habitat with a volunteer group at a different beautiful place of your choosing in the Twin Cities area. Uh, so this coming Saturday, there will be a group on the 3M campus in Cottage Grove working with Friends of the Mississippi River and helping to restore Oak Savannah along the Mississippi River. So this is kind of fun because it's property that normally is not open to the public, but you would get to see it if you are helping to volunteer. And all of the equipment is provided along with breakfast and a catered lunch. Uh, then the next weekend, Bassett Creek Park in Minneapolis is also cutting and pulling buckthorn. And at this one, if you go to this one, you get a free drink ticket afterwards that can even be used for alcoholic beverages. So that's an incentive. On Saturday, October 23rd, then volunteers are going to be at Sunfish Lake Park in Lake Elmo that are cutting buckthorn and reseeding with native plants. And there they are going to burn the buckthorn to make the bonfire that they make the hot dogs with. So that's fun. Um, and then the last weekend of the month, you could go down to Pine Men Bluffs Natural Area in Invergrove Heights. This is another one that's normally off limits to the public, um, but another Friends of the Mississippi River event where they will have people out doing habitat restoration there. Yes, I know, right? <laughs> So four fun ways to get involved, um, even if you don't have a yard or land of your own. Okay, so the um, next thing that I want to talk about is water. And it might not initially seem obvious why I would talk about water 
when talking about birds, unless of course I show you a photo of a loon swimming in the water. So a lot of our birds are waterfowl and um, you know, all those, all those habitat areas along the edges of lakes, streams, wetlands are really important. Um, around this time of year, a weird thing starts to happen. It, and this goes back to me talking about leaves and what not to do with your leaves. Um, a lot of people who live out in rural areas start gathering all the leaves off of their lawns and then dumping them into wetlands, into ravines, um, you know, over the hill, back to where you can't see it anymore. And though leaves are natural, and though I just told you all the great things about them having so many nutrients, which is great for your lawn, what we don't want to have happen is for all of those nutrients to get concentrated and dumped into our water, because that ends up leading to algae growth during the next year, spring and summer. Um, so we're trying to get the message out there that even though leaves are natural, it is not good to pile all your leaves in natural areas and is in fact um, illegal to do so. Have you heard of the adopt a drain program? Please tell me you've heard of the adopt a drain program. Um, this is a program that was started about seven years ago now. And what we are doing is encouraging people to adopt storm drains that are in their neighborhoods. And you go to this adoptadrain.org website and you can pull up a little map and it will show you where all the storm, you just type in your address and it shows you where all the storm drains are in your neighborhood and you can click on one and you can adopt it. And by adopting it, basically all you're doing is agreeing to go out there maybe once or twice a month and you do just what this kid and his dad are doing. You go out there and you are raking up the leaves and the grass clippings and whatever might go down into the storm drain and you're disposing of them properly. You pick up the litter. It should take you maybe two minutes twice a month. So it's a super low um, commitment volunteer activity, but we have had 16,426 storm drains adopted so far in the Twin Cities area. So I think that is really fun. It's a really great, easy way to get involved and it is a nice way to help protect our water. So if you haven't already, go adopt a storm drain. Um, if you do live on the water or you have property up north, you have a cabin that's on the water, it's really important to protect the shoreland buffer areas that are along the water and um, not to cut down the vegetation to be able to more easily access the water because we have a lot of really, really high quality habitat concentrated in those areas right along the water. About 43% of threatened and endangered plant and animal species live in or depend on wetlands. And it's not just birds, it's turtles, it is frogs, it is salamanders, um, all sorts of wildlife that are living in these areas. So we also at the Washington Conservation District frequently work with landowners who might move into a home and have something that looks like this. So in this example, um, the, the woman who owns this property out in Stillwater Township, it's about an acre of land. And she called our office because she said, well, I've got this you know, little pond that's out there. You can see that whoever had previously owned it was using it as a very highly manicured space. You know, they had mowed all the way down to the pond. There's a little fountain that's down there. It kind of looks to me like the kind of fountain and pond that you might find in, um, you know, like. The, the parking lot of a Target, <laughs> but it's in, you know, in her backyard out in the country. And she wanted something that would look, look prettier and provide more habitat. Um, it is steep slopes. They were sick of mowing it. It is, you know, really soggy, wet ground by the time you get down to by the water's edge. And our office worked with her to design and install a transformation that makes it look like this. And, and isn't this like 10,000 times better? Um, so what they did basically was take this, you know, highly altered, um, oh, there we go, highly altered non-habitat and turn it into something that really is a functioning intact habitat that provides places for, you know, the turtles, the frogs, the salamanders and the birds to be able to find food, to live, to shelter. So um, in many locations, there is going to be grant funding available through watershed districts 
for projects like this to help you pay to do something like this and um, other assistance through the conservation district in your area that you could help you help you figure out how to get started and what to do. So on that topic, then the 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 last thing that I wanted to talk about tonight, planning for next year, uh, because it's it's not quite the end of the year, but it is kind of getting to be the end of the growing season. And so a lot of people were thinking not so much about what we want to do in our yard this year, but what kind of changes we want to make for next year. Um, surprisingly, you might not realize it, but uh, fall is actually an okay time to do native plantings. So if you are getting the, you know, getting the creative urge and wanting to get out there and put some more native plants in your yard, don't think that you need to wait until the spring. Um, you could be planting them right now in the month of October. You could probably be planting all the way up until mid-November when the ground starts to freeze. Um, but if you are interested in doing something like a dormant seeding of a prairie bee lawn or lomo, early to mid-November is actually one of the best times you can do that as well. Um, so feel free to follow up with me by email if you want more information about how to do any of those kinds of projects. But just want to put it out there that it's not over yet, that the fall, fall is still a good time to do things. Um, the Washington Conservation District and most of the other conservation districts in our area do an annual tree sale. So we usually start accepting orders around November and we um, pre-sell the trees. So you order them in bundles of 25 bare root tree seedlings for $35. And then at the end of April, next spring, you come out to the Washington County Fairgrounds and you pick up your trees and away you go. Um, so this is something we've been doing since 1978 and our office typically sells around 20,000 trees per year. There's a heck of a lot of trees going out there. Um, so just you know, keep an eye on our website. I know that Anoka Conservation District also has a tree sale. Um, Chisago Conservation District has a tree sale. So there's a lot of opportunities to buy low cost trees if you are looking to do habitat restoration. Um, I did wanna highlight some tree species in particular for a specific reason related to birds. Many of you may be familiar with this book, Bringing Nature Home, which was written by Doug Talami. And in his book, he talked about the importance of having native trees and native shrubs in our yards because they attract the native insects, which are what the birds eat. And so if we have a tree, which is a decorative tree, but not native to here, it might only attract hmm, like three different species of insects. Whereas if we have a native tree, it might attract a hundred different species of insects. And I don't want you to be creeped out by the idea of having a tree covered in insects. Um, these are insects that provide a foundational, um, you know, the, the foundation of the food web. So these are what the birds are eating and a critical source of protein for them throughout the year. So basically you plant these kinds of trees in your yard and you are guaranteed to get more birds. So just a few of the ones and I'm gonna start with ones that are good and move up to ones that are super good. So hackberry, this is a nice, good option. Nannyberry, I'm starting with ones that are kind of smaller trees to large shrubs to smaller trees. Nannyberry, this one gets really pretty fall color. Um, pagoda dogwood, if you have a shady yard, a lot of times people say there's nothing that grows. Go to dogwood is one of the ones that is native and grows well in the shade and has this nice kind of uh, pagoda, pagoda like shape that it will make with the branches. Um, hazelnut. And of course, this is fun too because hazelnuts are edible if you wanted to experiment with harvesting them. Uh, the tree that I have in my front yard, hawthorn, I just want to tell you about why I love it because I don't see very many people putting hawthorns in their yards, but I think it is just beautiful pretty much throughout the year. So in the spring, it gets these pretty little white flowers. Uh, during the summer, it's just a nice tree. At this time of year, the berries have turned bright orange. Then the leaves start to turn, they get this really pretty orange and red color. And then I almost like it best of all in the middle of the winter, because look at it, it's so, it's so nice. It's got this bright pop. Um, the berries were bright orange and they turn bright red by the time you make it to December. So it's just so nice to have a pop of color in the winter when everything else is uh, brown. And it gets tons and tons of birds in it. So I always see lots of birds there. 
Uh, wild plum. This is another good one. Red osier dogwood. Black cherry. We're getting up there. White pine. Uh, red maple. And white oak. This is the granddaddy in terms of bird habitat. Uh, the white oak is a host to 512 species of larval insects. So it's basically just a big giant bird buffet. Um, obviously oaks are slow growing, but if you have the room and you have the time, plant an oak now and it will create great habitat into the future. Um, so as I'm wrapping up, just wanted to share some resources to help you get started if you are interested in doing things on your own property. And I can email all of these to Katie tomorrow so that everybody who registered, you can, you know, she can send it out to the, to the list and everybody can get these in easily clickable fashion. Um, obviously, you know, Audubon, Minnesota, you are at an Audubon program, tons and tons of information about birds, conservation, community science on the Audubon website. If you live out in Washington County, like I mentioned earlier, we do offer free site visits. So you can even easily go to our website to request one of those um, and also go there to find information about the tree sale, buckthorn, native plantings, local cost share programs. Uh, if you are anywhere in Minnesota, the bluethumb.org website is a great resource, kind of a one-stop shop for everything having to do with native plantings, native gardenings. So there's a plant selector tool that can help you figure out what will grow right in your yard, native plant suppliers and contractors, workshops and events, um, all sorts of really great information you can find there. <laughs> and all right, looks like we've got Audubon of Chapter of Minneapolis also has a Facebook page. So this is, this is a great place to stay in the loop as well. All right. I'm gonna see if we got if we've got questions here. I didn't see any popping up. Great, thank you so much. It was wonderful seeing just so many opportunities for people to take action no matter where they live. Um, lots of really cool resources as well. And uh, loved seeing the adopt a drain element too um, for Audubon chapter of Minneapolis members, people who are on our email list, um, they would have gotten a call to action at the beginning of the month here, kind of the change of the month that fall is our, our big ask to adopt a drain and uh, looking at getting as many of those creative fun drain names as possible. So it'll be really cool to see mm -hmm. what people come up with. Um, so to keep things organized for us, uh, if anyone has any questions, let's drop them into the Q&A function. Um, I know chat can kind of get lost a little bit. Let's keep all the questions in the Q&A function. And uh, we will be, we're, so we're recording this program and it takes us a couple of days since we're volunteer supported for us to get that recording downloaded and uh, get it up um, available through our uh, social media platforms. So we will be posting that and any of the resources and things that um, Angie will be emailing to us, we'll make sure to get those posted in the, the comments as well through social media. Um, and we'll have this available on our YouTube page as well. Uh, so if you have somebody that maybe missed the program tonight and you think they would really enjoy uh, having a listen and a look and seeing what uh, they can be doing in their own gardens or in their own areas, uh, you will know where to look. Uh, additionally, our program for November. Uh, traditionally, we like to host our programs on the first Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Time. And so we are going to, um, this is not a major uh, presidential election year, we are going to have our program on November the 2nd, 7 p.m. Central. We'll be getting the program posted uh, within the next day or so here, hopefully, to our website and our Facebook page and get that out there. Um, and it happens to be, uh, so I know some of the content that Angie was sharing with us today was focused on those dreadful invasive species and uh, the conservation story for November is linked to an invasive species that is maybe a little less known, especially for the crowd here in North America. So our very own, uh, one of our board members, Dr. Irene Bueno, uh, recently had a, a paper published on some research that is focusing on uh, conservation threat to birds, very serious conservation threat to birds uh, in the Galapagos. 
And so uh, this will be looking at how scientists approach um, risk assessment anytime we're looking at you know, what are our solutions for a conservation threat to, to birds or a habitat? And we know uh, that birds face a lot of different threats, whether it's the symptoms of climate change or habitat degradation, um, or perhaps predation by domestic animals or even invasive species. So birds kind of have it tough, um, but we're very lucky to have so many people who care about birds and wildlife and the spaces that we share with them. Uh, so we're very excited to have Dr. Irene Bueno as our speaker for November. Uh, and like I said, check our website and our social media uh, avenues over the next several days here. And we'll make sure to get that posted so you can register and get the date on your calendar. All right, uh, any questions for our speaker tonight? That was so great. I think we just wowed everybody with so many options. Yeah, today. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is tremendous. Angie, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we've got Keith uh, active again. Keith, is there anything uh, that you would like to share in terms of other ways that people can get involved with Audubon Chapter Minneapolis? I know we've got a ton of different ways for people to uh, to get together virtually and in person, safe social distancing, uh, to take some really cool actions, positive actions for birds. Absolutely. So uh, thank you, Angie, for a great program. Uh, you, you do this very well. Um, for the, those of you who are participating in the program, um, our chapter has a variety of ways in which you can get involved. Uh, please check the Audubon Chapter of Minneapolis website uh, for contact information for any of the upcoming meetings. Our advocacy committee um, is dealing with a lawsuit against the city because of the lack of environmental assessment for the comprehensive plan. Um, we're also um, uh, challenging both the city and the park board about a variety of environmental policies, and we could use your help with that. Um, commenting on plans and, um, and other um, activities uh, in, in the um, spaces in our, in our area. The uh, Community Engagement Committee is uh, planning field trips, uh, planning programs. Um, we'd love to have you step in there. Our Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and Belonging uh, Committee is building relationships with a variety of different organizations and um, uh, people of, of various diversities, um, engaging more diverse leaders and communities. And our Migration Partners Committee um, uh, has a, a MOSI bird banding station starting up in uh, the Zamorano area in Honduras and here in November. And there's also now, um, we learned just uh, today, uh, moving forward on developing a partnership between classrooms in our schools here in Minneapolis with some classrooms in Honduras about environmental education. So check our website, um, make contact with the leaders of each of these committees and do join us to get involved. Uh, Katie, do you wanna say any more about particularly community engagement activities or? Uh, we have the next meeting uh, coming up very soon. So check the website and you can reach out to uh, myself, certainly. Um, I will, I believe our contact information for that meeting um, is on the website, but there's a lot of really cool things that we want to do this fall in terms of getting out to bird. Um, we really want to get a group kind of reignited around um, bird ability, so accessible birding, um, and get out there while the weather is still good. Um, we've had a lot of conversations with uh, birders who are using wheelchairs and thinking about um, not only just the quality of the trails and being able to gain access to those areas before there's snow and ice and things like that, um, but also the temperature that impacts um, the batteries as well. And so really thinking about all those different things. And um, we have a small group that is raring to go and wants to get out and start evaluating some places that we think could be really great for seeing birds in the fall. Um, and we can help to evaluate those great birding spots 
for uh, birders who do have accessibility challenges and then contribute to that larger birdability effort that National Audubon Society is participating in. There's a great website where you can either uh, participate in birdability uh, birding outings with us or you can go on your own. So we encourage you to check that out and, and learn about that initiative as well, uh, because we do believe that outdoor spaces and birding um, should be accessible to all. And we wanna do our part to support that. Um, outside of the birding and just having fun, we definitely have some service opportunities and volunteering. Um, and we'll be talking about some of those pieces at our virtual get together soon. So go to our website and you can email me directly or Irene, our other co-chair, and we'll tell you what's happening and when. We'd love to have you join us. And it looks like we do have a, a question yeah. in Q&A. Yeah, I, I did see that. A question from Sue. When should we stop deadheading our flowers for birds and wildlife? Um, so I assume you're, you're talking about like when you're deadheading with a plant that will keep flowering, like a lot of plants, you deadhead them and then they'll flower some more and deadhead and flower some more. So basically when you get to you get to that point where they're not going to flower anymore and this is just kind of their final seed head that's when you would want to yeah go ahead and, and cut it out and um, just leave those remaining seed heads up for the fall and the winter then yeah plenty more food for birds i get a mm -hmm. lot of action on uh, a lot of my comb flowers and things like that with a lot of the finches it's and chickadees as well. It's really fun to enjoy them and they get a little bit closer to with some of the gardens in the winter. It's pretty neat. Yeah, um, I don't know the answer to this question from Sue. When should we cut back summer raspberry plants for the birds? Do the birds eat them? Um, the, I mean, the birds definitely eat the raspberries, but I, I think that's a question for Minnesota Extension. I bet you anything that they would have information about that on the Minnesota Extension website or the, the Ask a Master Gardener. Yep, I'm sure that they would. Um, I know leaving as much as we can for the birds is great. Um, and when you're thinking about cutback, um, what you know, what is it that you're trying to achieve with the cutback? And thinking about you know introducing that that wound and you know how does that plant respond to that type of an injury um, essentially? So yeah, I think that's a great recommendation to check resources and to get you know the best advice you can so you can set yourself up to be successful uh, in the spring and the summer for the following year. And two, um, if you know, you're a little concerned about um, cutbacks and you know, thinking about, um, well, I don't want this plant to be you know, out of control. Um, having, having that input, we have a lot of really great resources, um, but if you're a little concerned about it, I think there's no rush or no reason to, to clip right away. Um, it can provide a little extra cover for birds, depending on what, you know, your habitat is like. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's a great suggestion. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Of course. Thank you so much. Um, Keith, if you don't have anything else, I think we will release everyone to enjoy the rest of their evening. Well, and I hope the rest of their evening will include checking in with Channel 11 at 10 o'clock <laughs> to see about migrating birds and window strikes. That's right. Thank you so much for, for spotlighting that too. It'll be great to see and we'll have to get that posted. Thanks again, Angie. Take care. Yeah. Good night. Good night.